Hello, everyone. This is the Free American Press with your host, Alexander. Today, we are interviewing Andy Schickman with Miles Franklin uh, Company. Hello, Andy. Thank you for being on the show. Good to see you, Alexander. Thanks for having me. Glad you, to be here. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, well, I, my father and I started Miles Franklin together uh, 31 years ago. Uh, we have... Um, I don't know, I guess you could call us somewhat the embodiment of the American dream. We started on a wing and a prayer. Uh, my father's middle name is Miles, his best friend who loaned us $60,000 to start the company before the internet in 1989. Uh, his middle name was Franklin. We uh, bought him out two years later, and I guess as they say, the rest is history. We um, recently eclipsed $6 billion in sales. We've never had a customer complaint. Uh, we are one of only 27 United States Mint authorized resellers. Uh, we have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and worldwide exclusives with Brinks. We're very proud of our reputation and of our history. The state of Minnesota, where our corporate office is domiciled, doesn't really care about sparkling reputations, however, as they are the only state in the United States to um, regulate a federally non-regulated industry. And therefore, we uh, are licensed. Uh, nowhere else in the country is that mandated. We are bonded, which is the big one. Nowhere else in the United States is that mandated. And we have compliance, continuing education, and annualized background checks of everyone in the company, myself included, all principals, all employees, annually. And if there's ever a felony related to financial services in the state of Minnesota, you are forever disqualified uh, for uh, from being in this industry. So in an industry that is fraught with uh, less than honest players in some cases, there are many good companies too, but in an industry that lacks regulation, you'll always find companies that try to um, extort as much as they can out of the system, whether it be honorably or not. We're very proud of our reputation. We're very proud of our relationships in the industry with some of the most widely known people in the industry. Uh, and we're also... Um, happy to say that the, the regulation in the state guarantees all of our clients around the world, the safest transaction here in the United States in a federally non-regulated industry. Well, that's great. Yeah, I like how you're trying to promote, you know, gold and silver, because that's real God's money. I just look at what happened, uh, you know, in history, we've always used gold and silver, that was real money. So that's great that you're doing that. So what are your thoughts on precious metals? Uh, to me, they are wealth. It's not an investment, albeit Many people will have you believe that's what it is. Uh, in my book, it's not. It's, it's wealth. It's been wealth for thousands of years since the beginning of time, uh, biblical time. It's, uh, you know, wealth uh, in, in retrospect, uh, in, in the eyes of pharaohs and kings and queens and emperors. And, um, you know, anyone of, of wealth throughout the years owned old gold and silver as a form of immutable wealth. Um, and, you know, every single currency that has ever been has died. Um, Dr. Franz Pick once said all paper currencies inherently are meant to die. They, they uh, regress to their inherent value of, of paper, zero. Uh, gold and silver are the only things since the beginning of time that have retained value and have been universally accepted by all of um, civilization as wealth, no matter where you are, no matter when you were. Um, long after the dollar bills in our wallets are replaced with something digital and hanging from a frame in the Smithsonian, gold and silver uh, will, will still be wealth. And uh, I think you can see that as well by uh, the accumulation by the most wealthy and sophisticated players in the world right now have not forsaken gold and silver. In fact, I think they've gone on a crusade over the last four years to accumulate as much as they can. So when I look at gold and silver, I don't see anything other than wealth and 5,000 year old wealth. And when I accumulate gold and silver, it is not to get wealthy, it is to um, accumulate wealth and to protect it. It's more about wealth preservation and return of your money than wealth accumulation and return on your money. Yeah, definitely. Actually, we already see a recent example of what you're saying with the money system you know, getting destroyed. Actually, in Venezuela, where my mom is from, the bolivar used to be worth uh, around the same as the U.S. dollar, but now it's worthless. 
So people are buying houses with silver and gold right now. So what you said there really makes sense. And we've seen uh, lately in the world that banks seem to be downplaying gold and silver. So why do you think JP Morgan owns the most silver in the world and what are they preparing for? Well, I mean, JP Morgan accumulated all of that silver um, really since 2008 when they inherited Bear Stearns shore position. Uh, my good friend, Chris Marcus, who I know you've interviewed with before, um, had, uh, interviewed Bart Chilton, the former head of the CFTC, who validated all of these things that I've been saying for a very long time in all of my public speaking, long before I knew Chris and long before I knew who Bart Chilton was, I had been saying that um, the market was being manipulated by the commercial banks. You can go back and look at most of my, my speeches going way back. The folks at Gata, Bill Murphy and Chris Paul, we all owe them a debt of gratitude as they shined a light upon this years ago. And we were one of the very first um, precious metals companies to sign on to the GATA movement and to donate to, to their endeavors. But when you look at a company like JP Morgan, who has used the manipulative practices of, of naked short selling on the COMEX market to drive down the price to create a narrative um, uh, of, uh, of low prices and of um, no need to buy a barbaric relic like gold and silver, through that environment where they just paid over a billion dollars cumulative in fines to the Justice Department pleading guilty to manipulating these markets, uh, they've accumulated the largest physical position of gold and silver combined the world has ever seen, uh, over 25 million ounces of gold and over a billion ounces of silver. And so you're looking at the most sophisticated, well-funded and well-informed traders on the planet who have used the manipulative price to accumulate what amounts to the largest physical position of metal the world's ever seen. Uh, shockingly, in paying this massive fine to the Justice Department, admitting guilt, they're still allowed to run and administer the largest silver trust in the world. In fact, they run two of them, one being SLV, talk about the fox guarding the hen house. But I think it's very important to realize that when I say price is not important, well, it is, but it's not as important as the actions of the wealthiest people in the world who are using price to throw everyone off the trail. Price is the ultimate tool of misdirection. It's the old, don't look what I'm, or don't listen to what I'm saying, you know, do what I'm doing. And, and that's kind of what, what we're talking about here. They're saying one thing and doing the other and they're using the price to, to create a narrative that allows them to say the exact, opposite of what they're doing and that is massive accumulation and we've been seeing that now for four years first with the central banks and now with the commercial banks and then uh, even further into the uh, now the sovereign wealth funds are taking copious amounts of gold and silver off of the exchanges so these are very interesting times where the wealthiest people in the world are repositioning and they're de-dollarizing ahead of what reset comes next I guess. Yeah, what you're saying definitely makes sense. So do you think governments and banks switch to paper money, you know, fiat money to buy up gold and silver with it? I think that's exactly what they do. First, they drive down the price. But yes, I mean, if you if you look at what the big banks have been doing and, and the central banks, they've all been repatriating their gold and accumulating it, large amounts of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you short the paper price with naked contracts, and then you use your uh, your your watered down dollars to accumulate the physical supply. I think that you know people have to ask themselves if if they get to the point of understanding and believing that there really is manipulation, and there is. If it's it's empirical, it's it's past the point of of it being uh, hyperbole, I mean, it's real. And, and when you see the former CFTC commissioner admit that it's real, when you see the largest uh, you know, bullion bank uh, pay a massive fine and admit it, when you see all the other bullion banks paying fines and, uh, for, for manipulating metals, and uh, you know, it's obvious that they're not just manipulating it for, for kicks, they're doing it for a reason. It used to be for something called Gibson's paradox, which is the inverse relationship between interest rates and gold. And they wanted to keep people happy in currencies and, and investing and 
in uh, bonds and, and taking out loans and doing things like that. So they wanted to squash the canary in the mine shaft, that being gold. Now I think it's well past that. And they are using their watered down dollars to de-dollarize, to reposition. I do believe we are on the cusp of a new system. And I think they're using gold and silver to act as um, the anchor to whatever new system comes next. And so I've seen it clearly for the last four years, a huge acquisition first by the central banks that kind of um, started the, the ball rolling. And of course the reclassification of gold as a tier one asset, according to the Basel three rules, um, you know, really, I think solidified and crystallized my, my thoughts. And, and quite frankly, the actions of these players uh, over the last three and a half, four years has, has not changed my thoughts one bit at all. In fact, if anything, it's reinforced it. Yeah, definitely. So you were talking about a great reset. So that brings me to my next question. When do you think fiat currency, the cur their currency system will end? And will it be replaced with gold and silver or with a global government cryptocurrency? It's a good question. I mean, I'll answer it in a few different ways. First of all, I don't hear enough people talking about the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative. I know that I've heard George Gammon mention it, and, and other than that, I'm the only one I hear mention it. But I think it's really important. You have the largest infrastructure project in human history that's underway now, and it's connecting Asia and Africa. It's connecting 65% of the world's population. All of the contracts that are involved in this massive project, 40, over 40% 40, 40 of gross domestic product globally, uh, is A, without the dollar and the United States participation, and B, the majority of all of these contracts will settle in a Chinese digital yuan. Wow. So the Chinese have already issued a parallel currency to their paper yuan. It's a digital yuan. And they are incentivizing their populace to shift to the digital yuan, although not mandating it. But think about this. When you talk about things over time, if 65% of human population will be indoctrinated into a new world reserve challenger, let's say, um, I think the likelihood of the dollar retaining singular world reserve status is naive. Um, will it be a IMF um, a special drawing rights like a lot of people think? Perhaps. Could it be a BRICS nation currency, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, with all of the gold that they've accumulated over the last several years? Could it be that they rise to issue a new currency to challenge world reserve? Could it be a East and a West where uh, the U.S. is forced to issue a new basket of currencies, uh, perhaps with its Western partners backed by gold, tethered uh, to gold uh, with custody denoted on a distributed ledger. Sure. However you look at it, I think the days of the dollar retaining its singular world reserve status are coming to an end. Uh, I think the reason you would have a crypto element to it would be because it would offer some sort of immutability, some sort of guarantee that the gold that is perhaps anchored to the uh, to the new currency. And I say that because I think it will be. I think that's why they reclassified it as a tier one asset. It will have some part in a new world reserve currency. I do not think people will ever drink the Kool-Aid again when we see what the US and all the Western uh, world is doing to currencies. They are destroying them rapidly. And um, you have to have a tether to it, some sort Sort of, a, of a backing. Now, I don't think it will be convertible one-to-one, -one, but even if only 10% of a new dollar was backed by gold and that gold and the custody of that gold was, was denoted on a distributed ledger, um, I think you would have people that would be willing to, to uh, jump back into the pool. But um, so, yeah, I think the answer to your question is, I think there will be a crypto backing to it. I mean, it's Look, uh, the, the politicians would love being able to put their thumb upon everyone's actions and, and movements where privacy is a thing of the past, where, you know, it's either barter or be in the matrix. And, uh, right. you know, there's no longer paying for cash for, for the kid who mows your lawn or for, for the money you lost in a, in a poker game or, or playing golf with your buddies or paying the babysitter or whatever it may be. It's now everything you do goes on a distributed ledger that the Federal Reserve sees. And uh, it, it, it's a scary, frightening thought, one that we shouldn't be excited to see anytime soon. I knew this was gonna happen last year. I've been saying it since last March for one year. If you go back and listen to what I've been saying, 
virtually every podcast. I said it because I knew it was coming when Nancy Pelosi in her House subcommittee finance bill last March called for a new digital dollar because evidently viruses can live on paper currency. It's killing two birds with one stone. And it also then allows the Federal Reserve to not have to lend money into existence through the commercial banks, which is a big deal. You're seeing no velocity because the commercial banks don't want to lend. So uh, if the Fed had the ability to deposit money directly through a Fed wallet right into everyone's phone, it would allow them to do monetary policy uh, and a workaround without relying upon the commercial banks. You see, all the money that the Fed has created to buy bonds called quantitative easing, all that's done is support the bond market and bring down the back end of the bond uh, market, bring down the yield so that interest rates stay low. So people uh, feel wealthy. It's called the wealth effect. Their 401ks are strong because no one's going to be buying fixed income uh, securities or bonds under the price of inflation. So you get people speculating in stocks and, and buying more homes than they can afford because interest rates are low. But in order to get that money into the system, when, they, when the Fed buys the bonds from the commercial banks, commercial banks then have two options. They can either park it at the Fed in a reserve account with safety earning, you know, right now about a percent and a half, uh, or they can lend it to you and I. They can lend it to you to, to, to buy a new car or to buy a new home or to go to college or a home equity loan. Whenever the lending is done by the banks, that's creating money. That's how it's done in this country. And if the banks don't want to lend because the economy is, is fragmented and fractured and uh, companies are hanging on by a thread, many have already gone bankrupt, making people's balance sheets or the bank's balance sheets uh, not look so good. They're saying, heck, let's just leave it at the Fed with safety. We don't want to lend it to the public and, and risk more foreclosure and bankruptcy. And so that then uh, is creating a lack of velocity. And the Fed wants velocity. That, that velocity, which will ignite inflation, makes it easier to pay off the tremendous amount of debt that they've created. So I guess in a very roundabout way, I would say I would think there'll be parts of everything that you said uh, in a new currency system. I think it will have some sort of backing. I think it will have some sort of distributed ledger technology behind it. I think it will be digital. I think the days of paper currency are coming to an end. And I would not be surprised if it were issued by the IMF as a special drawing rights or a Western and Eastern currency system where you have uh, the Western banks issue a gold back new currency and the, block, uh, the, the BRICS nations. Brazil, Russia, China, India, South Africa, issue a competing currency. I guess we'll have to see, but any way you draw it up, I do believe one thing. I think that the dollar's days of being the singular world reserve currency are coming to an end. Whether it be a challenger, whether it be uh, a new system altogether, I just think that we are nearing very, very quickly the ending chapters of of the US dollar as its singular world reserve status as it's been for a long time, over 50 years. Yeah, I think uh, you're definitely right about that. I think the main thing is that they don't want people to hold physical gold and silver. They wanna digitize it like you were saying, you know, under a cryptocurrency. So uh, we see, uh, you know, China's building the Great Belt Initiative. And we also see China, the main thing they're taking their first step is building a social credit system, basically where they can track everything you're doing by phone, you know, their digital currency. So that brings me to my next question. Do you think cryptocurrency aids in the social credit system? I think it competes with it. I don't know if it aids the social, I mean, that social credit system would be more along the lines of a central authoritarian uh, monitoring system. I think that the cryptocurrency, much like precious metals, gives you freedom from that type of um, system where you know you have the ability to use different currencies and uh, different mediums of exchange. And if I had to guess in a situation like that where you have a social credit system, um, I could see cryptocurrencies being um, prohibited by the authoritarian leaders because it gives them an out to that system which all centers around monitoring and, um, you know, uh, central government rule, authoritarian rule. So this is why you're seeing cryptocurrencies do so well. This is why you're seeing the big, big money 
regardless of the price, um, take possession of metals. I think it's to uh, be removed from that type of a system, which is coming where, you know, if, uh, if, if they want to enact negative interest rates, if they want to, uh, because you didn't, someone thinks that you didn't pay your taxes where there's a mistake, they can deduct money from you. They can, they can do whatever they want when it's a digital currency system and there is no freedom and um, you fall in line or you face penalty. And, and I think very quickly uh, when money can be added or subtracted from a digital wallet pretty quickly by, by the central government, um, it's a frightening thought. So as, as it pertains to that, I would think cryptocurrency is, is an escape from that type of an environment, not aiding it. I think it is a, an alternative to it. Okay, so that brings me to another question. So basically, um, who made Bitcoin? Was it the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto or the United States government? Who do you think created Bitcoin? Uh, I have no idea. I'm the wrong person to ask. I did read the white paper, and the white paper was designed by the N or the, the the hash tag. Evidently, I think it. And again, I this is what I took away from it. I'm the wrong person to ask, but I do believe that the hashtag, uh, the I don't even know exactly what I'm saying because I'm the wrong person to ask. But it was created by the NSA, um, okay. as as was the white paper. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't think it was one person. If I had to guess, it was the United States government. Just basis from reading the white paper a half a dozen years ago. But but as it pertains to cryptocurrencies. While I believe they're here to stay and I respect them, and I think that there's room at the table for both precious metals and cryptocurrencies, it isn't an, an all or nothing. I do own some myself. I'm the wrong guy to ask about the inner workings and the plumbings of it. I don't understand it nearly as well as probably many of your listeners do. Okay. So do you think, um, so back to what we were talking about, whether it be cryptocurrency or a combination of gold and cryptocurrency. Do you think cryptocurrency is kind of a distraction from gold and silver? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, um, I think uh, to a large degree it is, but it's also uh, woke people up to the merits and the argument around crypto, I mean, around precious metals. Um, you know, the whole narrative being freedom from the system. And um, so they're, they're, the argument is the same. Uh, um, and, and that is uh, privacy, uh, that is uh, being outside the dollar, that is uh, the things that are beneficial to, to cryptocurrencies, I would argue, you will find in precious metals. Uh, and I do think it's been a distraction in the respect that you would probably see uh, gold and silver gain more market share if it weren't for cryptocurrencies. But then again, I would argue the people your age have woken up to what's going on. And that's something that I never thought I would see. Uh, you know, most people thought that the millennials would have no interest in precious metals. And quite frankly, they, they are a whole lot smarter and more coordinated than any, any of us gave them credit for. And uh, I admit I was wrong. I, I often wondered about, you know, what would happen as, you know, my clients started aging and moving on, what would their children do? And, and um, I've been proven, I think, wrong in the respect that, you know, this Reddit phenomenon has proven that, that there is a great interest in precious metals because it's the same narrative. It's freedom from the system. You know, gold and silver are freedom. No one knows what you have, where it is. Um, and it's been valued as wealth for, you know, thousands of years. So, uh, I think that people who have made a lot of money in cryptocurrencies could do a whole lot worse than pulling some of that money off the table. Profit's not a four letter word, put it in gold and silver and put it away. Hope you never need to use it. If you do, whether it be an emergency or an opportunity, you're damn glad you have it. And then if not, you give it to your children someday, knowing that, you know, there are very few things that have lasted thousands of years that are still considered by all humanity wealth, no matter what you hear negatively about it it's being accumulated by the wealthiest people in the world. And that I can promise you. And so it's not going away anytime soon. So is it a distraction? It's a distraction only in, in the respect where people say it's dead and it's barbaric and you should only be in cryptocurrencies. I think that's just as naive 
as as saying that you shouldn't be in cryptocurrencies. I think there's room at the table for both. Yeah, what I was looking into, a lot of people say how Bitcoin, you know, is digital gold, like it's as good as gold and it's decentralized. But the main thing that I have against, you know, cryptocurrency is that it's not decentralized at all because anything on the internet can unfortunately be controlled by hackers or, st or the governments. But the good thing about gold is that, you know, it could be, you know, with you in a space and then they can't take it from you right away, at least. That's one of the benefits. I think gold is actually more decentralized than crypto is. Well, I just read an article the other day that said the U.S. government is talking about passing a law whereby uh, any money that is sent to a third party wallet has to be captured in terms of the identity by the the platform that is sending it. Now here again, I am not the crypto guy and I don't understand the inner workings and the plumbing. And if I'm saying it somewhat wrong, I apologize. I'm just simply saying do, uh, the, the article was written in the light of um, uh, money laundering. And do not think that that the central planners are not aware of you know, the fact that people use cryptocurrencies as a means to evade the system and to be out of the system. I get it, uh, but I would, I would agree with what you're saying. Uh, it is not because it all boils back down to dollars. And I think that when you finally come out into dollars is when you have a problem trying to retain anonymity. So um, look, I think Bitcoin is, is, has certainly, um, it has certainly surprised me. Uh, Andy Hoffman, who used to work for me, was telling me to buy it at 400. And uh, he was ahead of his time and he was right. Uh, I've been surprised, but when I look at how difficult it is to get out, like if you wanna buy gold with it, it's not like you can buy gold with it and be completely uh, anonymous to the company you're selling it to. And so the third party, party to party ability to transact is where the anonymity is and what I just read and it said that the government had had reserved comment on this yet, but in the vein of money laundering, when funds are transferred from third party to third party is what they're trying to put the kibosh on and get all sorts of information on who was this transferred to, what was the identity of person A and person B. Are they able to do it? I don't know, but I think they're aware of it. And that's for that's for darn sure. And in a world where privacy is waning, again, uh, <laughs> I look at the efforts that we've seen by the sovereign wealth funds to repatriate or to rather take possession or delivery of metal off of COMEX and the London Metal Exchange for the last year and a half. And it, it's very clear to me that huge money is taking metal and possession of it and delivery of it. And maybe that's the exact same thing we're talking about here, money outside the system, really, that in the end, no one knows about. Because if you would have bought gold from me three years ago, where is it? Is it in the bookcase behind you? You know, is, is, it, is it in your closet? Is it in your front pocket? Did you bury it in a hole in the ground? Is it in your safe deposit box? Maybe you lost it. Where is it? Exactly. And, and so that's, you know, anonymity in a world of decreasing privacy is, um, is, is I think one of the, the big issues or big uh, allures to precious metals and to cryptocurrencies. The question is, is, there, is, that, uh, is that belief true or is it lacking in um could there be unintended consequences by trying to be ultra private as it pertains to cryptocurrencies down the road and that's kind of what i took away from this article yeah the the main thing that i was looking at is that i guess every purchase that you do with a uh, bitcoin is actually put on the blockchain so everybody can right. see the purchase and yeah so it's pretty uh, amazing so do you think cryptocurrencies and fiat money allows banks and governments to make money out of nothing? Um, well, fiat currency certainly does. I mean, if you look at how money is made, it, uh, made so what, when you talk about Bitcoin, there's a finite number of, of units at 21 million that can be issued. So not so much, that's the antithesis of it. But when you talk about fiat, when we talk about quantitative easing, the Fed pushes a button and creates money. And at, at, at present time, they're only really allowed to 
buy uh, government backed bonds, uh, Fannie and Freddie and um, um, uh, US treasuries. So although they have merged closer with the, the treasury so that they've been able to actually go into the market and buy corporate bonds and that kind of stuff. But when we talk about money creation, the Fed creates money with a keystroke and they buy bonds from the commercial banks who buy them from the treasury. The Fed doesn't buy them directly from the treasury, but they buy them from the, bon uh, from the banks that buy them from the treasury with money they create out of nowhere. And they buy the bonds, which then drives down interest rates, stabilizes the bond market. The banks, as we talked about, have an obligation really in normal times to lend that money out into the system. That's where money is created out of nowhere. And in, in expansion of credit that we've seen over the last several years, that's why there a lot of money was created because people were buying homes and, and spending and borrowing and you have a massive expansion of credit and money creation. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what fiat currency is. And um, really that's where the problem lies is that they've created so much in the way of currency. You know, it, it took a few hundred years in this country to create its first billion dollars where we had fought civil wars and, and you know, through hyperinflation and Great Depression and, and world wars and it took all that put a man on the moon before our first trillion dollars was created. Uh, in, in a span of uh, six months last year, we created four trillion. It's, it's, uh, the money creation is extraordinary and, and there will be consequences to pay for that. So yeah, I think, you know, that's always been the argument for having a gold standard uh, is to put a tether upon what governments can do, just creating money out of nowhere, creating wealth out of nowhere. And all of that money creation has created distortions and made it very difficult to find true price discovery uh, in many things. Um, when you see a stock like Tesla move up, you know, 700% or when you see Bitcoin move up, you know, a thousand percent or whatever. These are movements that we traditionally don't see in investing where, you know, it's, it's, it's growth. It's seven, eight percent a year growth. You're a rock star, uh, you know, and, and when you see 700 percent growth and people expecting this type of, um, you know, crazy growth in, in equities and in cryptocurrencies, when, when that is the norm, uh, you know, that creates a whole bunch of problems. And that is courtesy of, of the distortions created by all of this easy money and, and easy credit. And, um, you know, when, when a stock market can go to the moon, when the economy behind it doesn't justify it, that's the, the giant tail wagging the dog. Uh, right. It's supposed to be that the stock market is a reflection of the underlying economy. And so we're seeing, even in the precious metals market, they use the manipulated paper price, the big money does to accumulate it. If you see all the demand that I see in this industry, the price should be to the moon. Here again, there are distortions, there are manipulations, but none of it changes the ultimate outcome. And um, there will be a price to pay for the crazy money creation. And it's the destruction of the currency and probably ushering in of a new system um, as we completely blow up and destroy this economy through massive, massive money creation. Again, another two trillion uh, in, in stimulus, uh, you know, getting rushed through the House and the Senate, uh, like it's no big deal. But remember, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. That's a trillion seconds. They've created six or seven or eight trillion dollars in the past year. Wow. Uh, and those numbers will never be repaid. The amount of debt that we have north of 140 trillion in Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, government, military pensions, all of these entitlements they'll never be repaid. And so that is why I say the days of the dollar are coming to an end. That and you can see what the biggest money in the world is doing in preparation and in front running of, of whatever it is that comes next. Yeah, and I was actually looking a little bit into the crypto and uh, silver, basically how much they're worth for the entire market share. So silver is like a trillion and a half and then Bitcoin is a trillion. And a large percentage of the silvers being bought by banks and stuff like that. So in theory, I would think uh, a lot of the Bitcoin being bought is from banks and other organizations. So do you think banks and uh, the Federal Reserve are pushing Tesla, Tesla stocks and crypto to grow for some reason? Uh, I don't know if it's the banks or not. 
I don't think so. I mean, you know, you look at the S and P 500, it should be the S and P seven. You have, you know, six or seven or eight really big stocks dominating the market. You know, uh, I, I haven't looked lately, but Tesla fell by 30% recently. So, I mean, there's still volatility. A stock doesn't go to the moon forever. Um, he's, uh, it's a very interesting company with very interesting revolutionary ideas, challenging the system. I, I think when we talk about silver and in particular looking at it in the way that Tesla would, there are very few assets on the planet that are bracketed by huge demand on two sides, both uh, on a monetary side and an investment side. And, and when you talk about um, Tesla as an example, the need for silver to make his cars and his batteries and anything else that he wants to do, um, it's, it's imperative. And, uh, and same is true with Apple and Samsung and the Chinese Belt and Road Rail Initiative. And there are so many needs. I mean, in, in military, there's 500 ounces of silver in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile. Silver is needed. And so much of the silver that's ever been mined since the beginning of time is gone in landfills. It was used in industry. And so when we look at all the silver that's available right now, um, you're right. Most of it is gobbled up by, by industry. Much of it, like, for example, if you look at what's in the, in the, uh, the, the London Metals Exchange, the LBMA, uh, almost 90% of it is, is already been uh, accumulated uh, by ETFs. And so there just isn't enough silver to go around based upon the massive amount of demand in things like batteries and solar power and, and this green new initiative. And uh, you could, I think, be very hard pressed to find something that offers better fundamentals than silver does right now. Yeah, I think you're definitely right because, you know, silver, you actually use it for industry. Like you can make jewelry out of it. You use it for supercomputers. You, you, you use it for the, it's, really became even more important in the technological era that we're in right now. And that's one of the things why I think gold and silver are a lot better than Bitcoin, because Bitcoin isn't used for industry at all. It's not used for anything. And that's what made gold and silver a store of wealth, because it's actually used for something. So I completely agree with what uh, you're saying. So what are your thoughts on copper? You know, I wouldn't accumulate it physically. It's too heavy. Um... It hasn't been viewed as monetary wealth the way that gold and silver have for thousands of years. To me, when we talk about silver being bracketed on both sides between monetary and industrial, copper to me is just industrial, whereas gold is mostly just monetary. Now they both have some uses on the other side, but if I were gonna buy copper and I think it is a good play right now, I would buy Freeport McMoran as an example, a copper stock before I would buy physical copper. Um, you know, people don't look at copper the same way they do gold and silver. Show someone a silver coin versus a copper coin and watch the difference in their reaction. So um, I think, you know, uh, copper, which is often a leading indicator of, of many things in, in the economy because it's so vital in, in, um, in you know, construction and industry, um, it's more of a industrial metal to me, but one that has certainly um, some, some good upside potential, but I would find it more in a stock like Freeport McMoran than I would in buying the physical. Yeah, I found it interesting. I was actually looking at the copper to gold ratio chart uh, for the last 250 years, and it showed copper, it used to be like really high until that we went off the gold standard. And then the copper to gold ratio, like copper was like next to worthless to gold after that point for some reason. So why do you think that occurred? Why do you think there was that massive change in the copper market? I really don't know, to be honest with you. I, you know, I, I've never really followed copper um, to that extent. I just, um, it's never been to me anything in terms of a monetary choice. So um, I own Freeport Mac brand and, and I own it for the reason that I believe copper is a good play but I wouldn't uh, know enough about it in terms of its relationship with gold going back that far, other than to simply say that, um, you know, maybe copper had some sort of a monetary role back then. I don't know, to be honest with you. It's a good question, but I don't know. Okay. So do you think the need of gold and silver uh, and electronics will create a shortage in the metals? 
Oh, that's just part of it. I don't think that's the whole reason why. I mean, silver, you could argue already is in short supply. The last two years, two years ago, there was a 240 or 50 million ounce shortfall between uh, what was mined and, and what was demanded. And last year, over 300 million. And that's with most of the industry on the sidelines due to COVID. Silver is found in nature in a form called or a fashion called epithermal. It's very close to the surface. So the big deposits were found long ago. In fact, over 70% of every ounce of silver that comes to market each year, roughly 800 million ounces um, total, roughly 550 to 600 million of those ounces come from mining of other metals, byproduct of mining copper and gold and, and you know zinc or whatever. Uh, it is um, rarely do we see new silver deposits that come online and, you know, uh, only 30% barely of what is mined every year is from dedicated silver mines. It's a depleted asset and it is depleting even more. And when you realize that there are so many uses for it uh, and in a fashion that is called um, uh, inelastic, meaning the, the, the industry that uses it, uses it in such small amounts, they don't care how high it goes. If you need a hundredth of an ounce of silver in an iPhone, or you need one ounce of it in a solar panel, you really don't care how high it goes, or three ounces in a Tesla, you don't care how high it goes, you just need it. And that's why these industrials would be foolish to not be accumulating it using these low prices, courtesy of uh, the, the, the four or eight large commercial banks that have been shorting it uh, to accumulate as much of it as they can. The problem is it's getting harder and harder to get. And I think they're aware of that too. So I would argue you will see lots of acquisition by the industrials because it is needed. It is harder to get. It is in continual deficits. And uh, you can see now by the demand and the physical side of things that it's also becoming more of a hot topic where if I owned uh, Tesla or if I was on the board of Apple, I'd say, we need to open up the treasury and go buy some silver right now. So we don't need to worry about this for the next decade because without it, we can't make our phones or we can't make our batteries or we can't make our solar panels or whatever it is that we need silver for. If you don't have it, it doesn't matter how high it goes. Uh, if you don't have the product, you can't make the, or the silver, you can't make the product. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So you said that the silver supply is starting to get a lot less than what it has been so do you think it's going to become much more expensive to mine gold and silver in the near future what do you think of mining costs well yeah i mean the mining costs already are going up as it pertains to to silver because you have to dig further and explore more and of course now we're seeing oil move up and you know um i would expect in an inflationary environment all costs to go up so yeah, I would think that you have to expend more money to uh, get less out of the ground. Um, in fact, there was a branch of the US government that is involved in um, uh, natural resources and I forgot the name of it, but several years ago, they published a report saying that it was their belief that silver would be the first item removed from the periodic table of elements just because it's depleting so much. So there are a lot of people will tell you that gold is much more uh, rare than than silver, and in in geological terms, it's true. But just about every ounce that's ever been mined since Genesis is on you know on the planet somewhere, whether it be in the form of coins or jewelry or bars. Uh, it pays to um, recycle it out of industry, but silver, so much of it is gone forever. When you talk about such minute qualities uh, quantities being in so many things that you've touched since you were born, all of us. Over the last 80 years, all of the things that we've touched that conduct electricity from a simple light switch to a hairdryer, to a calculator, to a flip phone, to a Walkman, to a handheld video game, to a Xbox, to whatever you can think of, it's got a little bit of silver in the motherboard, a little bit of silver that doesn't pay to pull it out. And a lot of that stuff's in landfills, never to come back. So silver is depleted. It isn't recycled. It, um, you know, it, it's it's got every, every quality one would want in an investment. Um, lots of uses, depleted, more demand than there is supply, undervalued, below its all-time high by almost 50%, accumulated by the wealthiest people in the world, shorted by banks to keep people from running to it. I mean, there's a million reasons why 
everyone should be buying it. And that's, you know, what I'm thankful for the Reddit group for to, and people like you to have alerted the younger people out there to, you know, um, to, to an injustice and to a real opportunity. And uh, so I'm very, I'm very optimistic that we will see uh, much, much higher prices in silver. And if not for the industrial uses in and of themselves, we now have a growing monetary awareness, uh, a reawakening, you know, and silver has been valued as money for 5,000 years. It had been forgotten in this country since 1965, actually since 69, uh, when some of the half dollars were still silver, 40%. But really since 1969, all of the coins that we would throw around as currency in this country were void of, of precious metal. Um, and so it's kind of left, it's a whole generation where people have forgotten um, that gold and silver are money, um, not just an investment the way that they they look at them now. Yeah, definitely. That actually brings me to my next plus, uh, question. So why did the whole world simul uh, simultaneously get rid of the gold standard and what was their plan in doing this? Well, it wasn't the whole world that got rid of the gold standard. It was uh, President Nixon who closed the gold window in 1971. From at the end of the war, World War II, all the allies met in Bretton Woods, New, New Hampshire in 1944, where the dollar took the role of world reserve currency over from the pound sterling. Um, uh, all of the currencies, uh, the countries would have pegged their currency to the US dollar at that point. Um, and the, the US um, treasury said to the rest of the world, here's a deal for you. Give us your gold and we'll hold it for you. Now you can redeem, we'll pay you for it in dollars and you can take those dollars and send them back to us anytime you want and get your gold back. It's for the governments, it was redeemable one-to-one. -one. So give us your gold, we'll safeguard it, we'll pay you for it. But better yet, buy our treasuries, buy our treasuries and now you'll be earning interest on your gold. Uh, we'll pay you back in dollars, you'll earn interest on something that's not earning interest. We'll hold it safely for you as the world reserve currency. We just won the war. We're the safest nation on earth. Earth, we're the strongest. We are a creditor nation. We'll hold it for you. We'll pay you dollars. With those dollars, you buy our treasuries. You help finance our endeavors. We'll pay you interest. And if you ever want your gold back, send us back your dollars, and we'll give it to you. It was a good deal for the world. They got to earn interest on their gold and keep it safely, uh, allowing them to have greater um, trade with the U.S. and and in nineteen in the in the late nineteen sixties into into seventy. Uh, de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, I believe uh, was his name of, of France, started uh, repatriating um, or turning in all of the dollars for gold and started draining the treasury of all the gold when Nixon basically double crossed the world and said, game over, we're keeping the gold, it's no longer convertible. So it was by force, more or less, they said, too bad, the game's over, we lied, more or less is what happened. And since 1971, there has been no gold standard and uh, the dollar has been set free uh, to okay. had no tether and, and, and has lost 70, 80, 90% of its value since 1971. So um, it was de facto, it wasn't agreed upon. It was by decree, I guess, of the US government. Okay, so why do you think the rest of the world went along <laughs> with what happened? Why do you think the whole world just got, a, got off of the gold standard the same time the United States did? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. You would think there would have been more mutiny. Uh, and I think that the rest of the world is finally catching on that the U.S. has been able to live well beyond its its uh, uh, its right to have le lived as well as we have uh, beyond our means when we can continue to print our way into prosperity. The rest of the world lacks that luxury. And um, and that's why I think, you know, we're here towards the end game. You're seeing um, a drive back to precious metals and away from the US dollar when you see the benefit of cryptocurrencies and you see what can happen to look any government that wants that has the ability to print versus austerity and tough decisions will do so and they um, are inflating the, the currency away to worthlessness they are destroying it and so you know um, that's why I think that there won't be another 
fiat world reserve currency ever again. I don't think anyone will ever trust it ever again. And um, you know, maybe it's because we had the strongest military. Maybe it's because we've still had the best economy. Um, I don't know what the real reason is, why there wasn't more mutiny. But nonetheless, um, you can see that people around the world are waking up to the, to the realization that it hasn't been fair. And it's you know, look, look at it this way. 190 countries from around the world that comprise Bretton Woods, uh, or excuse me, that comprise the International Monetary Fund, rather, that was founded at Bretton Woods, they've asked for a new system, a new Bretton Woods. So you have the whole world is basically saying it's time for a new system. Uh, and when the International Monetary Fund comes out and says publicly, we want a new Bretton Woods, well, Bretton Woods is what we were just talking about when the dollar was anointed world reserve. And you have 190 countries that are basically saying enough is enough. Yeah, definitely. So that uh, also, I wanted to ask you too, since you know how the dollar has no value, except that the United States says it's backed by the United States government. And that makes it a fiat currency. So do you think cryptocurrency is a fiat currency because it's not actually backed by anything? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's not fiat in the respect, some of it would be, but you know, Bitcoin wouldn't be because it is, it has a finite number of units that can be produced. So, you know, to me, fiat means you can just continue to create it uh, and create it and create it until it becomes worthless. The whole allure of Bitcoin is the fact that it's decentralized and it has a finite number of units. Um, and that's what really, what, you know, part and parcel anyway, part of it would be with the gold standard. You, you can only create as much currency as you have gold backing it. So that's where they are similar. The decentralized part of it is, you know, really, I think what, what turns people on. But, but here again, you know, uh, is it really, as you were saying, do you have as much anonymity as you thought you did? Uh, and um, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Are those days coming to an end? I don't know. But the fact that, at least when we talk about Bitcoin, that you can't make more than 21 million ever, well, then no, it wouldn't be fiat in my book. But I'm sure there are a lot of cryptocurrencies out there that don't have those types of constraints that then would be. Okay, so what do you think of uh, government confiscation <coughs> of gold? Is jewelry better than coins? What, are, what is your opinion on that? I think that if, if, um, if the US government tried to confiscate precious metals in a world where China and Russia and many other countries, even communist countries are promoting it, gold ownership to their, their people, it would be the end of, of the United States as we know it. Uh, if, if our creditors feared Venezuelan style nationalization of assets, it would be, it would be game over. I think really the, the, um, I think the, the, the big target to me would be um, United States IRA accounts. Uh, I don't know what at last count, 15 trillion maybe, 14, 15 trillion in, uh, in IRA uh, accounts that I think could very easily uh, be sequestered, mandated to put in some sort of a US treasury annuity program where you're guaranteed a certain return in US treasuries. Uh, in 2009, the, um, this was brought to the House floor, a bill of this magnitude. Uh, it was voted down, but when I saw that happen and the genie being let out of the bottle, to me it became, um, I think, target number one. <clears throat> I think if they wanted to confiscate gold and silver, they would be far better off to take the ETFs, GLD and SLV, you have you know, the, the first or second largest stockpile of silver in the world in, in SLV. Uh, you have um, one of the largest stockpiles of gold in the world. And, and again, there's been a lot of debate whether or not it's all there and, and the prospectuses changing and all of this stuff, I get it. But there is a lot of gold and silver in the ETFs of the world. Uh, it would be much easier for the government to come in and nationalize those ETFs, with, which really don't allow you to take possession of it than it would be to go door knocking house to house, trying to take people's gold. Uh, in 33, when Roosevelt confiscated gold, everyone had it. It was part of the fabric of the society. Most people have never held a gold coin or a silver coin in this country anymore. And I would argue the law of unintended consequences would be more than they would bargain for. 
largely guns and gold go together in this industry and, and you would be knocking on people's doors who don't have the same patriotism that they did in 1933. And I, I don't know that you would see police or army shooting against their own citizens in this country. I don't think you'll see uh, uh, a eminent domain uh, turn in your gold or else clause. I think they could go after ETFs and IRAs first uh, with much less global pushback and get more money with less hassle. And all of that stuff would be like that instead of going door to door to door to door to bank safe deposit box and creating a, a, um, a backlash in the world financial community that certainly we could never once, never again try to be world reserve currency or center of free trade. It would never work ever again. So from a lot of stuff that you've been telling me about how, you know, silver is being manipulated by the banks and the banks seem to be the root of a lot of the problems happening in America. So that brings me to my next question. Should banks be abolished as they were in the original California constitution? Well, you could argue if we get a Fed coin, they may be on the way out as it is, uh, you know, because if the money comes directly from the central government, from the central bank, what do you need regional commercial banks for? You really don't. If there is no cash, if it's a cashless society, what do you need banks for? You're not going to the bank to get your cash. Money comes directly from the federal government. Your paycheck goes directly into your account on your Fed wallet. Uh, Maybe that's happening. Maybe they're on their last leg. I don't know. But if you look at what is the root of much of the evil in the system, it is the big commercial banks. They have been, look at all the fines they've paid over the last decade for rigging markets like LIBOR and Forex and precious metals. And, you know, they're, they're slapped on the wrist. They pay minuscule fines. As an example, JP Morgan paid 920 million and it went up to over a billion dollars. But 920 million was the fine. Their metals desk in the same year made over a billion dollars. So that, you know, from the initial fine, they made $80 million and were still allowed to run the SLV Silver Trust. So is that really a penalty or is it a hand slap? This is a company that makes a billion dollars a month, a month in profit. And they paid 920 or a billion dollars in fines for manipulating the metals market. That's nothing to them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, the banks certainly look at a bank like Wells Fargo and all the fines they paid for creating accounts that no one ever signed up for doing all of these horrible things and, and really nothing happens to them. So should the banks be abolished? Yeah, I think they should. And if the Fed has their way, they will, um, because they would like to, to, you know, have everyone deal directly with, with the, uh, with the central bank and, um, right. it would allow them allow them to enact monetary policy much easier. They could spend money into existence rather than have to lend it into existence. And the whole game would change at that point. So you think they want to make like a forced federal bank kind of thing where you have to, you know, get your crypto from kind of like the federal bank of the United States. Okay. Yes. So was there anything else you'd like to add? No, I, you know, I, I just appreciate the fact that a young guy like you is spreading awareness. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, I think that, I, I think that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And for people to think that gold and silver are, um, you know, relics of the past and, and are meaningless, just look at what has happened over the last four years. And the biggest money in the world is, is taking possession. You have all the central banks repatriating their gold from the New York Fed for the last four years and from the Bank of England. You have gold re reclassified as a tier one asset. You have the IMF asking for a new system. You have a third group of reportables called the others and the COMEX, which is largely sovereign wealth funds that are draining the COMEX of metal and the London Metals Exchange, taking as much off in a month as we see in a year. They took off more gold and silver last year than we typically see in a decade. These are the, the wealthiest private investors in the world. And when you see what has happened over the last four years where you know the most sophisticated and well-funded investors on the planet are de-dollarizing i think that's what everyone needs to do also is to mitigate your exposure to the dollar whether it be in cryptocurrencies or precious metals the biggest problem that we can have is being locked into a sinking ship so um 
you know, give us a call, uh, uh, email us at info at Miles Franklin or call us at 800-822-8080 and uh, let us earn your business. You know, the one thing that we have struggled with over the last several years is, is do we want to be an online company or have any online presence? And there is a tremendous amount of hacking and identity theft. Uh, when you see the Federal Reserve can be hacked, when you see Sony can be hacked, when you see, you know, these big institutions are being hacked, several of the biggest online companies, precious metals companies have been hacked. It makes me very nervous. I have chosen to be old school. We closed our online store two years ago. We do everything on, uh, on the phone. Um, it's not as convenient, uh, but we try to make it worth everyone's while. Our prices have been the best. Uh, or real close to the best in the industry for over a year. Uh, we've done this for 31 years without a customer complaint uh, and we're licensed and we're bonded. And we'd love your listeners to give us a, send us an email and, and, and put your name or the name of your show in the, uh, in the subject line. And we'll make sure that they get treated exceptionally and are offered the best possible price in the country. Uh, we are building a new website. We may acqui acquiesce and add a little bit of an online presence in the next several months. And it's looking more and more that that will happen. But until then, you know, we're old school. So give us a call and uh, send us an email and uh, add when you can. Um, you know, one last thing and, and I'll let you run. And, and, and it shaped the way that I have... Um, saved money for 31 years. When I started, I mentioned at the beginning of this call that I started this company with my father and, and I was, how old are you, by the way? 17. You're 17. Well, you know, Elijah Johnson, who works for me, first interviewed me when he was 17. And he, uh, um, he's made a career of it now. And um, when I was 19, I started in this industry. You have time on your side. And um, when I started, my father said there'd be only one rule and one rule only, or he'd fire me. We started the company together. I said, okay, I can deal with that. What is it? He says, you'll buy something every two weeks, period. You can do that. You have a job forever. Well, I own the company now and I'm the president of the company and well, he won't fire me any longer, but I've honored my promise to him for 31 years. I've bought something every two weeks, never ever missed a two week period. And you look back and you say, my God, Look at all of all I've accumulated. And when people say price isn't as important as accumulation, when you look back at it after 30 years, that's a true story. It isn't as important. I don't remember what half of what I own I paid for or more, most of it. I don't remember what I paid for. it. So when people say it's about the number of ounces that matter, that is true. And that's why I say buy on the dips, don't chase the rallies and buy whenever you can. And, you know, um, I'm not trying to be disingenuous by saying the price isn't as important as getting out of the system and accumulating it. And when you look back at it after many years, you'll understand that. But I guess I would look at gold and silver as wealth. And it's been looked at that way for thousands of years. That's the way I look at it. And I hope I never need to spend an ounce of it. And if I do, not just for an emergency, but an opportunity, I'm damn glad that I'll be able to do it. And if not, it'll go equally divisible amongst my three children and hopefully divisible amongst their children, my grandchildren someday. And that's the way that I look at it. And I think for all of you and your listeners, especially the younger ones like you, that is the right way to look at it, not as an investment, but the way that the wealthiest people in the world have looked at it for thousands of years as wealth, immutable wealth that you can pass on through generations that will retain its wealth in the year 3000, when my great, great, great grandchildren are still using some of the gold I passed on to their great, great grandparents, you know, God willing, uh, it, it will still have wealth and they'll be able to uh, transact with it. That's the way I look at it. And um, from there, everything else just kind of unfolds. It, uh, it's easier to deal with the ups and the downs and to just to shut your computer off sometimes and, and realize that, hey, this is not my investment. This is my wealth. It's my money and I'm going to spend it someday, some way, somehow, either I'm going to spend it or my kids will, or my grandkids will. And when you look at it that way, it doesn't affect you as much as, um, you know, an investment would where you're watching it every single day. So I guess that would be my two cents. We'd love to chat with your listeners and uh, have them reach out to us and yeah. we'll make it worth everyone's while. Well, yeah. Thank you for being on the show, Andy and everyone, uh, all the viewers, please check out his website. 
milesfranklin.com. And uh, nice talking with you. And I hope we can have you on the show again soon. I'd love to come back anytime. And if there's ever anything I can do for you personally, you let me know as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you for everything you watched. Absolutely. You take care. Have a great rest of your day. You too.